North Carolina House Speaker Pro Tem Dale Falwell is running to be your next Lieutenant Governor. We discuss his campaign and his issues next on North Carolina Now. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. Good evening, I'm Kelly McCullen, and thank you so much for watching this very special edition of North Carolina Now, where I'm joined on the set by House Speaker Pro Tem, Representative Dale Falwell, a lieutenant gubernatorial candidate for this discussion in the Republican primary. Thank you, sir, for being on. Thanks for having me. Well, let's get right to it. You sit in a top House Republican seat in the House. House Speaker Pro Tem, you're walking away from it, retiring, to focus on Lieutenant Governor. Why do that? because I've realized that even after a very successful career of passing 29 major pieces of legislation with over 4,000 yes votes, 200 no votes, and no gubernatorial vetoes, that it's not passing the laws that's important. It's, uh, it's affecting change through the agencies of North Carolina. And the Lieutenant Governor is someone who has a foot both in the legislative branch, which I very much enjoy, but also a foot in the executive branch because in order to get North Carolina moving again and getting peop get people back to work, we have to have uh, elected officials who are gonna be verbs and not nouns. People who are gonna be willing through their stomach, through their heart, and through their minds to get into the agencies to fix the problems of North Carolinians. Now, you say work within the agencies to make this change happen for a better North Carolina. There are candidates out there for various offices saying get rid of the agencies, get rid of a lot of them. You agree with that? Well, I don't know what the other candidates are saying. I know that I'm a, I'm a, a proponent of public education. I'm, I'm a product of that as are, are our children. Uh, and I know that the Lieutenant Governor has one of, is one of two elected voting members of the State Board of Education, which controls over half of our budget. Also elected voting member of our Community College Board, Economic Board, and others. But at the end of the day, what we need is elected officials who are willing to get in, to figure out where the problems are, listen to North Carolinians, act, and fix their problems. Because, as I said earlier, that's the only thing that's going to get North Carolinians back to work again. Uh, you know, uh, if you follow state government, people will know your name. A lot of people don't follow the legislature. They might have heard of you, don't know much about you. You are a Republican. Uh, we've seen the other campaigns, particularly the uh, presidential primaries, mm -hmm. where people are defined by being social conservative, physical conservatives, either or, not much, both. But mm -hmm. how do you view yourself as a Republican? I view myself as a social and a physical conservative. You know, when I was coming into your parking lot today, the sign said, keep right. And I think that people have to politic the way that they intend to govern. And they have to live their lives the way that they're gonna politic. So uh, I consider myself a conservative, but also want to tell your viewers that, you know, a lot of the problems that we have, not only in North Carolina, but in the United States, is because people did not live up to their labels. You know, liberals did not liberate. Conservatives didn't conserve. Representatives didn't represent, and leaders haven't led. That's what's gotten us in the situation we're in. Other candidates are also out there touting their lack of political experience or lack of state political experience. Your website is quite proud of the bills you've had passed in four primary areas. What are voters looking for right now when they try to size up who can reform best? Is it the person with the experience or is it the person look on the outside looking in but wanting in to the political world? I think that uh, most North Carolinians understand there are three kinds of people people who create problems, people who ignore problems, and people who fix problems. Uh, when they go to DaleFallwell.com, they'll see examples of where I've listened, acted, and fixed. And in every one of these examples, it's the result, the result has been saving money, saving lives, or saving brains. And those are the three things that any elected official should be focused on. How do we get our state government to live within its means? How do we create laws that change the behavior of what we're trying to fix, and more importantly, and most importantly, how we recognize, embrace, and communicate that the number one natural resource in North Carolina is brains, and we're wasting a lot of it. Well, 
a lot of people out there are saying that there's partisanship in North Carolina. It's a toxic environment in both sides, lobbing rhetorical bombs at one another. I have, I've seen you on video on two different occasions say, people don't care that we fuss and fight down in Raleigh. They want us to fix their problems no matter how you get it done. Why do you say that? I don't hear other candidates saying that. Sure. No, people do not care. I disagree with the national pundits that they want us to get along. The people of this state want their problems fixed. The citizens of North Carolina want their government to act conservatively because every day there's about 80% of North Carolinians who agree with me on, on 80% of the issues. Secondly, the businesses of North Carolina, they want to feel like that when they're dealing with their state government that they're not guilty until proven innocent. That's one thing that's resulting in this horrible statistic that I'll share with your viewers. And that is the number one employer in 18 counties in North Carolina this morning is the unemployment check. The number one employer in Mecklenburg County today is the unemployment check. We have to get people back to work. And one way that we have done that in, over the last 12 months, and that we're going to do that going forward, is focusing on the invisible challenges that face North Carolina. What are the invisible challenges as you see them? Well, the first invisible challenge is debt. You know, I brought these chips here to kind of show your viewers that uh, just two decades ago, this is the amount of debt that we had in North Carolina. And currently, this is the amount of debt we have in North Carolina. The debt has grown at about two and a half times uh, the average that it should have grown over the last 20 years. But it's not just the debt, which is things that you see, it's the invisible things. The three billion dollars that we now owe the federal government for unemployment insurance. And the fact that we have small and medium sized businesses today that are getting experience modification forms where they're being asked to increase the tax per employer, per employee, in order to close this gap that we owe to the federal government. We're also facing a pension debt. And that's a, we have a well-funded pension plan, but it's falling below expectations because we assume that it's gonna earn seven and a quarter percent a year. Well, with interest rates falling, the, that money earned 2% last year. The last 10 years, it's only earned 5%, but we're, we're expected to earn 7%. And of course, the very large one here is the unfunded health care liability associated with our active and retired employees. That's just state worker health plans, the state health plan. <laughs> state health plan retirees. Uh, you know, people who are employees of the state uh, obviously have health insurance, but there's an obligation to provide them health insurance. When I came in as a freshman six years ago, I, for example, I changed the vesting period on the state health plan. It was five years and one day, and now it's 20 years. That one change, according to our actuaries, has already taken over $600 million off of this stack. You know, it's ironic that uh, as we look at this, we need to understand that all these states going around go around and talk about their unfunded health care liabilities. As a percentage of our operating budget, our unfunded health care liability in North Carolina is one of the highest, if not the highest, in the United States. And it's going to crowd out other things that people care about. At the end of the day, Kelly, people don't care much for politics or politicians. But politics and politicians are a means to an end of something they do care about. Public education creating jobs, public roads, public safety. And when you have these invisible things that are crowding out the budget of North Carolina, things that people do care about are gonna suffer. Now, on a lecture circuit, a campaign circuit, you're diving into four, at least four complex issues that stump even people who follow the legislature. Right. When it comes to campaigning, it's about sound bites and it's about slogans and making it simple, good roads, as you say, good public education. How do you make that pitch with all those poker chips, with the debt, with the liabilities? How do you take that to the primary voter, get them to understand it as they weigh you against your two opponents? Well, uh, the way that I do that is by, by explaining to them that, as I said earlier, these are the things that are going to crowd out, things that they, they do care about. But more importantly, uh, for the first time in my life, I think people are going to choose the person over everything else. Because, as I said earlier, they don't care how much blood, sweat, and tears that we use in Raleigh. They just want their problems fixed. But the, the, the second important point I want to make is that I think the citizens are out ahead of the politicians. 
and they understand the difference between people who are just talking platitudes and people who have a track record of fixing things. Uh, we've all heard the analogy, and I brought an example with me, of the you have a squeak in your hardwood floor. Uh, a guy comes in, he has a nail in his mouth, he walks around, uh, he drives the nail, and he hands you a bill for $100. $2 for the nail and $98 to know where to drive it. I have a, a perfect track record of knowing where to drive the nails in order to reform state government, not just in terms of the invisible, but also in the areas of public safety, crime and public safety, and first responders, in the areas of public education, family values, uh, and all of those government regulation. But these, these debts and these liabilities cover both Democrats and Republicans. Sure. Uh, a lot of conservatives would vote, and they're state workers. They wouldn't want to give up the, any future health benefits. How do you bring down the health care costs for retirees so that all state workers, mm -hmm. or excuse me, all state citizens that pay taxes don't have to take on that burden? I think every elected official should start out addressing this question by saying, I'm sorry. It's inconceivable to me and to your viewers that the largest purchaser of something can't do it better and cheaper on behalf of taxpayers and the employees as anyone else can. You know if you had to buy a huge quantity of laundry detergent, you have a pretty good idea of where you're going to go. And the reason you're going to go there is the people you would be buying that from buy more of it than anyone else in the world. We are the largest purchaser of health care in North Carolina. And the fact that we cannot tell our active employees, our retired employees, our, and our taxpayers, why can't we do it better and cheaper than anyone else? That is something that I've worked on my entire time in the General Assembly and things that I will work on as your next Lieutenant Governor. As health care costs will come up if you're Lieutenant Governor, what is a tangible, easy to understand kitchen table way of shoring up the state health plan and reducing liability? Well, the, the easiest way, the, the second rule of this is to get the state health plan on a calendar year because as you know, our young families, when they have two people working in the home, uh, they don't get their information about the state health plan until months after the other spouse has already had to make their decision. We need to compete for those young healthy families within the state health plan. Secondly, we need to create a high deductible, a true HSA product that allows people to put the incentive on staying healthy versus using health care. Uh, give you one statistic. People my age, my gender, and my girth and above who work for the state, about 20% of them had an undiagnosed chronic illness. Undiagnosed. And the reason is, is we have not put enough emphasis on health instead of health care. And that's what's driving up these costs and that's what's crowding out everything else that your viewers care about in North Carolina. That small stack of chips is money the state is borrowing from the federal government so people who are unemployed can receive unemployment benefits. That money gets paid back with interest Correct. to the federal government. You cited it as a problem, mm -hmm. borrowing money to pay unemployment benefits. What do you do about the debt we already have accrued under that system? And, and if you don't like us borrowing, but there's no money to pay out unemployment benefits, what do you do about the unemployment benefits? Well, the first thing we have to do on anything the government is involved, the state government is involved in, is attack fraud. Uh, your viewers know that fraud exists in almost every one of these systems. The second thing we have to focus on is the differentiation between broke and broken. Our unemployment, our employment security commission system is not only broke, but it's broken. Meaning if the federal government were to come in tomorrow and wipe out this deficit, we would still have a process in place that rewards the wrong behavior. What we need to have in North Carolina is we need to have incentives that encourage people to go back to work as soon as possible. That was the spirit that I introduced the workers' compensation bills this year, and that's the spirit that we, we, with which we need to attack uh, this system also. Secondly, we need to make sure that we're not out of sync with our border states. Your viewers probably haven't thought about this, but for 55 miles, we have as much border with other states as California. But there's no population that lives on the border of California with other states. The reason I say that to you is that whether it's our tax policies, our sales tax, our gasoline tax, our unemployment security uh, situation, any entitlement or any program that the North Carolina has when you have that much border with other states, you better be the low-cost place to live and do business and not the high-cost place. And that's one of the reasons over the last 12 months I've 
work so diligently to reform the workers' comp system. Now you're seeing a sales tax idea floated uh, from the Democrats on the gubernatorial side, right. but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a serious issue. They're calling it sure. out publicly, wanting to lay it back on the table. You sunsetted the other temporary sales tax. Was that always a bad idea in your mind because you fought that temporary sales tax? And is there ever a time when a temporary sales tax would work for North Carolina to fill a hole? Well, I, I think that when, if North Carolina were faced with a true natural disaster, a, a, a sales tax that, that, that sunsets, I mean, those are the kinds of things that have been used in the past. But I want to be really clear. A sales tax increase hurts the poor first and it hurts the poor worst. And that's why I've always been opposed to increasing sales taxes and while I was in, in favor of allowing this to sunset. But the other reason is that, once again, going back to our border states, mm -hmm. we need to make sure that we're not out of sync with border states. I mean, the state to the west of us, Tennessee, doesn't even have an income tax. We need to make sure that this is an inviting place for people to live and do business, where people can bring their money, bring their capital, have the joy of achievement of creating not only wealth for themselves, but by hiring other people. That's the model that North Carolina needs to be under. Now, I want to go right to that about making the state hospitable on, on, the, on the vision that you're outlining. Magazines will say we're number one for business. We're one of the best places to live in, in America. You say we may have some competition issues with Tennessee, Virginia, South Carolina, and different areas. Which is it? Because if people read the newspaper or watch television news, you get mixed messages with it. Sure. The mix, there's no mixed message about the fact that the number one employer in 18 counties tonight is the unemployment check or the number one employer in Mecklenburg County. There is no mixed message about that, and that only captures the people that are unemployed. The unemployment rate is even higher. You know, one way of answering your question is actually to show this chart about the workers' comp system, which we've talked about in the past. Now, if you were a manufacturing company and you were thinking about relocating to one of our border states or North Carolina. The one chart that you would show them if you were Virginia, South Carolina, or Tennessee is the fact that North Carolina for decades did not have a cap uh, for temporary disability under the workers' comp system. So why would you ever bring your company and ultimately your jobs here if there was a lifetime benefit for a temporary disability? We reformed this in the, in the North Carolina this year. And it's not just politicians talking about what they're going to do or what they're going to sponsor. This particular legislation has already had an impact. Uh, you've seen these examples before, but sort of to dovetail into that chart, if your cameraman can pick these up, these are the workers' comp laws of our border states. These are the North Carolina workers' comp laws. It seems most workers, though, all they would care about, if I'm hurt on the job, right. and, well, and I wasn't negligent, I want my workers' compensation right. until I'm well. Correct. And that's what this bill does. It's called protect and put North Carolina back to work. Protect means that the first goal of a workers' comp system is for people not to get injured. That's the first goal. The second goal is to get them the medical care they need as quickly as possible and find suitable employment for them. And for those that are tragically injured, to get them everything they deserve and then some. That's what that bill represented. We, I have an email here from Goodyear, and the reason I'm bringing that to your attention is that the Goodyear plant in Fayetteville has to make 3,000 car tires per day to pay the workers' comp premium of that plant for that day. This reform doesn't just help the small business or the large business. The biggest beneficiary of reforming this system was the state of North Carolina because we're the largest employer of people. And we received an email a few months ago from Goodyear that basically went something like this. Representative Falwell, thank you for the reform of the workers' comp system. Unfortunately, after the bill became effective, we had an employee that was injured. And instead of having to reserve $400,000 for this claim, we only had to reserve $250,000. That's $150,000 that's gonna remain in the Fayetteville plant. And because of the suitability requirements, it looks like this individual, instead of being out for the rest of their life, is gonna be able to return to work between 18 and 24 months from now. So your, 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 your bill that was made in law allows someone who's hurt doing one job, perform, uh, yes. one job can find a, a, a suitable job doing something else, and as long as it's within right. reason, they it, have to take that job. Well, and that's something the employer wants. I mean, the employer wants to try to find them uh, alternative uh, employment within the plant. But the tagline to this whole email was this. 
It said, Representative Falwell, you may not know, but Goodyear recently has recently decided to close its Union City, Tennessee plant, which is the sister plant of Fayetteville. Same product, same size, same number of employees. We're told that a leading factor in deciding to close that plant versus the Fayetteville plant is the reform and the lower workers' compensation cost in Fayetteville. On behalf of our 3,000 employees, we want to thank you for that reform because as we attempt to compete globally, that we now know the world is no longer tilted against us. That's a lot of people. This is not a new company. We need to take account of the companies that are already here. That's Representative Dale Falwell seeking to become North Carolina's next lieutenant governor. Thank you, sir, for being on our show this evening. Thank you. And we'll be inviting all the major lieutenant gubernatorial candidates to appear on this program to discuss their campaigns and the issues important to them. Thank you so much for watching. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.